everybody and a very warm welcome on this wintry night to the Australian Institute of International Affairs here in New South Wales. Our event this evening is the interns addresses which our five interns will be giving us as they come towards the end of their attachment, their six month attachment to us here at the Institute. Each of them has chosen a topic, an international topic of interest to them and they're scheduled to speak for about eight minutes each. So at the end of 40 minutes, we'll have a period for questions which you may address to the individual speakers or for that matter, to all of them in en masse if that seems to be the right thing to do. If you're online, please address your questions using the Q&A function which you'll find on the foot of your Zoom screen. So without further ado, our first speaker is, Ju is Drew Beacom, a fifth year student at studying, majoring in international relations at the University of Sydney. Drew has been following events in the Pacific and in particular the recent turn towards China by the Solomon Islands and he's going to discuss Australia's role in the South Pacific. Good evening councillors and supporters of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. In this brief presentation tonight, I'll be outlining the role of Australia uh, in the Pacific, perceived and real, and then subsequently we'll highlight the opportunities and potential path for Australian engagement going forward. Now, it is no secret that in recent times, Australia and its influence have been lacking in the Indo-Pacific. Despite the outward posturing and chest beating in the, re uh, in the region, courtesy of AUKUS, the Quad and poor COVID diplomacy, Australia has overlooked Pacific Island states and traditional partners in the region, leaving the door open for China. Within the so-called Pacific family, as coined by the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison, Australia perceives itself as a regional power. This places Australia as a rhetoric and sorry, as a rhetoric and policy leader in the region, and much like a middle power, the supposed mediator between small states and great powers. In fact, in the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper, it is stated that Australia is a regional power with global interests, and that Australia would champion the role of promoting economic cooperation and greater integration within the Pacific and also with the Australian and New Zealand economies. The White Paper also frames Australia's role as a regional power in the context of shifting power dynamics within the Indo-Pacific, alluding to the increasing influence exerted by China in the region while the influence of the US wanes. The White Paper clearly outlines Australia's focus for the Pacific and its intention to secure relationships to balance the influence of China in the region. It is at this time the White Paper is released that Australia aims to solidify its regional power status, releasing the Pacific Step Up Program, a comprehensive regional assistance program. This program was introduced to strengthen relations in the Pacific through co collaborating with Pacific Island leaders and communities, providing a comprehensive response to address a range of local issues from infrastructure and economic development to climate change mitigation, at least in theory. However, at present, Australia is far from the benevolent regional power that it claims to be. Recently, as opposed to emanating peace and security and stability within the region, or promoting regional collaboration for the benefit of Pacific Island communities, the government has sought to advance its own strategic interest in the region, bypassing any semblance of regional cooperation. A prominent example of this is the AUKUS Alliance, the creation of which angered regional leaders including the Prime Minister of Fiji, who told the UN General Assembly that if we can spend trillions on missiles, drones and nuclear submarines, we can fund climate action. More than just an isolated incident, the angering and alienating of Pacific Island nations has been a consistent trend in Australian foreign policy for the last few years. Australia can surely talk the talk, but often refuses to walk the walk. The Pacific step up, while a necessary piece of foreign policy to maintain regional power status, has just fallen short. While efforts to secure and distribute COVID vaccines in the region have received praise, there is little visible economic development that can be attributed to the Pacific step up. Australia is also seen as reactive in the region, responding to China's increased engagement in a zero-sum game of power politics, framing all subsequent policy measures as being a result of geopolitical competition and strategic interest as opposed to considered and tailored policy programs. The result is a cooling of relations with Pacific communities that see the region being used as a political football field. Survey data released by the Whitlam Institute in 2020 highlights the discontent of this reactive approach, with many Pacific Islanders critical of the sense of parochialism and the unilateral nature of the Pacific step up, with criticism coming from Fiji and the Solomon Islands. Not much has changed since 2020, 
demonstrating a lack of regard policymakers have held for the region at a more substantive level. Despite billions of dollars in regional development and aid spending, Australia does not fare well in the Pacific. However, this is not due to lack of technical or expert ability, but much rather it is due to a lack of engagement. In the time that relations with the Pacific have soured, Australia has relaunched the Quad Partnership, secured a new military alliance in the form of AUKUS, and established a strong bilateral trade agreement with India. If Australia wants to live up to its role of a regional power, it must move away from the unilateral parochial engagement with the region, with the region and invest in Pacific sovereignty and Pacific interests. It is here that climate change is equally a threat and an opportunity. What has become, sorry, what has been a serious point of contention between Pacific Islands and Australia in the past could become a point of open collaboration and nation building as the more climate conscious Australian Labor Party seek to repair relations in the region and put Australia in a good stead to decarbonise. Through the creation of a regional climate conference engaged with in good faith by Australia, there is the the opportunity to strengthen relations. As the third largest exporter of fossil fuels, Australia has the potential to make a real contribution to tackling climate change and addressing an existential threat to the region. Developments around Australia's own commitments to decarbonisation and transitioning to renewables would be welcomed, while investing in renewable infrastructure projects in the Pacific and electrifying remote communities and developing a climate change mitigation strategy and fund would communicate Australia's political will to be collaborative and regional power. However, a continued lack of action on climate change would likely push Pacific leaders to reevaluate their commitments to Australia. Fijian P Prime Minister Frank uh, Bainimarama, who has criticised Australia as having an a dangerous addiction to coal, has made clear the intended pragmatism of Pacific Island nations on this issue, saying only recently that Geopolitical point scoring means less than little to anyone whose community is slipping beneath the rising seas. Continuing existing trends, the Pacific Islands will most likely leverage their relationships and commitments to various nations to win foreign aid, investment and potentially action on climate change. If Australia cannot offer substantial and good faith politics, it stands to only further alienate the Pacific community. Australia could also strengthen relations through demonstrating that the Pacific family is more than just political rhetoric. More comprehensive trade relations with the Pacific, like the Australian-New Zealand Closer Economic, trade Rela Economic Relations Trade Agreement, the creation of a Pacific Engagement Visa, which was ALP policy at the most recent election, and the development of pathways for visa-free work could all help improve Australia's standing in the Pacific, increasing economic opportunities within Australia and the Pacific, while also embedding within the Pacific, sorry, while also embedding Australia within the Pacific, offering Pacific Islanders the prospect of permanent migration. Finally, Australia must respect the sovereignty and autonomy of the Pacific Island states. That is, engagement with the region must be collaborative. If we are to learn anything from the lack of success of the Pacific step up, it is that engagement with the Pacific must be open and multilateral. Unilateral responses to commitments from China will be seen for what they are, and this is this will only continue to weaken Australia's standing, painting it as selfish and paternalistic. Thus, the proposed climate forum and trade agreements must also be constructed in open consultation with Pacific leaders, and the Pacific Islands Forum could provide a useful and open vehicle for this. Furthermore, rhetoric is important, and given, that the, increasing, given the increasing political tensions between the US and China, it can be expected that the Pacific will be dealing more heavily with China as it seeks to expand its influence. Leaders that reach bilateral agreements with China, as has been seen with Wang Yi's most recent trip to the Pacific, should not be ostracised for bolstering their economies, and each agreement should be assessed based on its contents, not its signatories. Paternalistic language regarding the Pacific, can, what, what the Pacific can and cannot do, will continue to push the Pacific away from Australia, especially given Australia's own history with infringing upon sovereignty and autonomy as a colonial power, and its continued lack of support for self-determination uh, with West Papua and the Chagos, um, Chagos Archipelago. Thus, while the future of the Indo-Pacific may remain uncertain in the face of increasing geopolitical tensions, it is without a doubt that the Pacific will be crucial to increasing influence and containing unwanted expansion. Australia must seek to be the regional power it claims to be, working in good faith to support Pacific interests and sovereignty, providing a pathway for economic development and strong relations that cannot be matched, built on shared cultures and histories. Thank you.
Thank you, Drew. Our next speaker is going to discuss the growing friction occurring between Afghanistan following uh, the takeover of the country by the Taliban and Pakistan focused on their border, a border which dates back to colonial times. Our speaker is Sachin Kunte, who recently graduated as a Bachelor of Arts specialising in uh, politics and international relations and international business at the University of Sydney. Sachin. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks Ian and good evening to everyone here and on Zoom. So, okay, so I realize that we've heard more than enough about border conflicts and border disputes in Asia. Um, however, as Ian said, I'll be presenting another one today. Uh, so drawn in 1893 um, by the British Empire to separate Afghanistan and modern day Pakistan, uh, the Duran Line is a 2,640 kilometer border between the two countries. Now, the main purpose was essentially to mark uh, the separation between Afghanistan and the British Empire's India. Now, but when the British left India in 1947, uh, the two separate countries were formed in India and Pakistan, and the Duran Line essentially became the de facto border between Afghanistan and modern day Pakistan. Um, however, the legitimacy of the Duran Line um, has been questioned by Afghanistan. Um, in fact, Afghanistan even blocked the notion to allow Pakistan to be a part of the UN in 1947. And every government in Kabul has been staunchly opposed to the legitimacy of the Duran Line, while Pakistan, of course, maintains that it's legitimate border between the two nations. So what exactly is the big problem? Why is it so contentious? Uh, well, it really goes down to the fact that Afghans claim that the Duran Line separates the Pashtun community and disrupts their trade and free movement, leaving them sort of divided between the two countries. Now, in Pakistan, Pashtuns are the largest ethnic minority, but they are the largest ethnic group along the Duran Line. Uh, on the other hand, Pashtuns are the largest ethnic minority in Afghanistan. Um, additionally, some Afghans have questioned the legality of the Duran Line because they say that it ended in 1993, 100 years after the agreement was signed as per the agreement, and um, also questions about whether the la line still holds after the British departure. Now, fast forward to 2021, apologize for the jump. Uh, when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, uh, there were celebrations in Pakistan uh, with Taliban's victory. Uh, former Prime Minister Imran Khan um, very famously called it the victory, the breaking of the shackles of slavery. Whose slavery? I don't know. However, these celebrations have been short-lived. Uh, cracks have started to appear um, in the relationship between Taliban and the Islamabad government and um, Pakistan's decade-long search for a friendly government in Kabul unfortunately still continues. So there is a plethora of evidence to suggest that Pakistan sought, sought Taliban's victory in Afghanistan, um, ranging from you know, elites and Imran Khan calling for global recognition of this new and inclusive Taliban to the, the chief of ISI, which is the Pakistan's um, secret service agency, actually visiting the, the new government and helping them set up the um, the infrastructure and stuff. Um, the hunt, unfortunately, as I said, continues. Um, but the hunt for a friendly government in Kabul essentially ticked one strategic box, but it is actually going to create more problems because the strategy in and of itself is very short-sighted. So Pakistan was likely hoping that Taliban government would accept the legitimacy of the Duran line. Uh, however, the Taliban is predominantly Pashtun and has stuck to the same rhetoric previous governments in Kabul have and to some extent even gone beyond by actually attacking Pakistani troops at the Duran line fencing. Um, how sustainable the strategy will be in the long run for Taliban is very questionable, um, as Islamabad is um, Taliban's most important ally at the moment. And as mentioned before, it is also the voice for um, Taliban gaining international legitimacy. Uh, nevertheless, the opposition to Pakistan or the Duran line likely increases domestic support for pa Afghanistan for the Taliban, uh, just because they're fighting, you know, domestic insurgencies like ISIS-K. Uh, so, in addition to the acceptance of the Duran line, Islamabad was also perhaps hoping that it could leverage Taliban's um, connection to the Tehreek -e Taliban Pakistan, which is the other Taliban, um, to broker a peace agreement with the latter. Now, the TTP, the Tehreek -e Taliban Pakistan, is often considered the deadliest terrorist group in Pakistan. Uh, they were, their most famous attack, or infamous attack, I should say, was the uh, Peshawar School Massacre in 2014, where 130 children were killed, um, along with 20 or so more adults. Um, and TTP is also predominantly Pashtun and has links and association to the Taliban. Uh, 
Um, in fact, many TTP leaders have actually sought refuge in Afghanistan. And um, when the Taliban came into power, they also released quite a few um, TTP fighters from prisons. Now, it's, it's fairly unclear how much sway the, TT, the Taliban has over TTP decision making and attacks. Um, but they did manage to broker a very short-lived ceasefire between TTP and Pak Islamabad, and even mediated some TTP stocks. Um, now, the reason I say short-lived is because the TTP, surprise, surprise, violated the ceasefire on multiple occasions. And there is a very strong belief in Islamabad that the um, increasing incursions have been encouraged by the Taliban because of the Durand line fencing as a retaliation for what they're doing there. Um, in fact, Pakistan's army chief, uh, Kamar Bajwa, claimed that the Taliban and TTP are essentially two faces of the same coin. Um, however, encouraging the TTP to conduct these attacks is unlikely to be in the interests of Kabul um, due to its dependence on Pakistan. But um, one understands why Pakistan believes this because there is a historic um, connection between the two, um, the two groups. Now, from a Pakistani perspective, the departure of Imran Khan's government was a huge challenge to the Durand line stability. Uh, the new government under Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif has begun addressing the national economic crisis and, of course, establishing their, um, their government and sort of fending off calls from Imran Khan to have a new election in place uh, because essentially the peace agreement with TTP was spearheaded by Khan um, and the new government is unlikely to follow Khan's strategy because, let's be honest, how, how often do we see governments born out of no confidence motion follow the same strategies as the ousted government. Um, but nevertheless, um, the groups are using Afghanistan to launch their attacks, and Islamabad is going to take a tougher stance on this. Uh, in fact, the week after Khan lost the no-confidence no motion, um, they targeted the Kunar and Kostfra provinces, which are very much on the border of Afghanistan on the east and Pakistan's northwest. Um, to sort of you know, attack the Taliban and TTP fighters and essentially tell them, you know, get in line or else. Um, now, the retaliation was a clear shift in the policy for Pakistan. Um, and, but nevertheless, the border is, definitely has far-reaching effects for both countries and the stability of the region. The recent airstrikes that I mentioned actually killed 50 civilians, aside from whatever TTP and Taliban people they also killed. Um, but it is going to increase more tensions in Kabul and Islamabad and, Adding fuel to fire, uh, the Taliban recently invited the Indian Foreign Ministry delegation, which is just going to deepen the mistrust because, I mean, I don't know if you've heard, but Pakistan and India don't really get along. Uh, <laughs> the, the, Taliban is unlikely, the Taliban is unlikely to back down from its position, irrespective of what happens. Uh, they're very staunch on that. And they are going to continue to prevent the construction of the fence, and they're going to continue providing refugee to the TTP members because it, A, it strengthens their domestic support, and B, it allows them to maintain some leverage over Islamabad, because Islamabad, to do the peace agreement, need to go through the Taliban. Uh, but then again, in the long run, not a clever strategy. Um, but yeah, again, ceasefires between TTP and Islamabad, I think there have been like three or four so far, all been violated, of course, um, are unlikely to stay, and terrorists like you know, Muslim Khan and Mahmood Khan, who have been just released by Pakistan, are just going to increase radicalization and violence. So basically, Pakistan fighting these two terrorist groups on three different conflicts on the Durand line is basically just three parties involved in very short-sighted decision-making. And as a result, there's just going to be more conflicts, more border skirmishes, and more violence. So I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. And now for the good news. Our next speaker is Oh, got the wrong page here. Our next speaker is Victor Liang. Victor is going to address us on New Confucianism, which is, which is a bringing together of uh, Confucianism and democratic thought, which is having a substantial following in both Taiwan and Hong Kong. Victor is a fourth year student at the University of Sydney, studying in advanced studies in international relations and international business. Pick that. Yep, uh, thank you so much for Ian's introduction and your kind words. So today, my topic is going to be New Confucianism and Chinese Democracy. 
So let's have some context. So within Western scholarship on democracy, there's been a lot of theories on the conduciveness of nations to the development of democracy. So this seeks to explain why some nations are democratic, whilst others are not. And within the discipline, there's lots of theories that have been developed to try and explain this, with one of which in the 1960s being the cultural theory to democracy. So the cultural theory argues that whether a nation is democratic or not is not dependent on economics or economic growth, but is rather dependent on their culture, their ideas and their values. So to these cultural theories, democracy almost requires a certain set of cultural characteristics that are both individualistic and liberal. And it's because of this that many of the non-individualistic cultures that don't fit well within the liberal and individualistic um, frame, they argue that democracy might not be a good fit for the nation and for their country. So historically, within this cultural theory of democracy, there's two different ideas. So the first idea is that the cultural theory would um, the implications is that only Protestant nations in the West would be conducive to democracy. So um, for these theorists, they highlight that there's an individualistic understanding of the relationship between humans and God in Protestant nations, which um, relates to the democratic principle of equality. And for Protestants, there's also a rejection of the need to defer to the mainstream and to um, adhere to the orthodoxy, um, which is also relating to the democratic distrust of large uh, authoritarian governments. But this idea, whilst it was really, really influential in the 1960s, has gradually fallen out of favour after the third wave of democ uh, democrat um, democratisation, which involved the democratisation of Eastern European countries, Latin American countries, and countries in South Asia. But whilst this view has fallen out of favour, the other view of the cultural theory of democracy have not. So the other view argues that whilst democracy can take hold anywhere, there are cultures that make democratization easier and cultures that make this harder. So to modern cultural theorists, they argue that cultures from the Middle East, from Africa and from Asia are rather unconducive and often even hostile to democracy, whereas Western cultures are more conducive to democracy and make the process of democratization easier. And this theory, particularly um, within like the 80s and 90s, have been really, really popular. With former Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, have, they've even supported this theory, arguing that um, instead of the universalized claims of like liberal democracies, there's also um, there might also be like Asian values under this cultural approach, saying that Confucianism would not make a country democratic but would rather create societies with collective loyalty to families, businesses, and the nations, and whose societal characteristics would involve the foregoing of personal and individual freedoms and liberties, which is key to democracy, and instead replace it with societal stability and prosperity. But this cultural theory is not without pro its problems. So in addition to the critiques already lobbied to the theory by Western scholars saying that this cultural approach presupposes liberalism um, in the process uh, for democracy, which doesn't have to be the case, this cultural determinism have also failed to anticipate cases where seemingly hostile cultures have led to the um, have. Um, led to the development of democracy, or at least haven't hindered it. So within Hong Kong and Taiwanese scholarships that have been gradually developed after 1960s, relating specifically to this point of compatibility, the idea of a synthesis between Confucian thoughts and democratic ideals have been proposed within a school of ideas known as New Confucianism. So this idea begins with an explanation of why China has not yet democratized. And this is done with the distinction of the government's political authority, which relates to legitimacy and the distribution of power, to administrative authority, which relates to everyday governance and rule. So with Confucian ideas, it focuses so much on governance. It focuses on rule and administrative authority. Um, and for this, it prescribes uh, things like societal harmony, um, it talks about everyone's place in society, of morality, of a collective outlook. And this has led to China developing a system that has allowed for the transfer of administrative authority. And particularly after the Tang Dynasty, there's a civil service exam system also implemented that has allowed for bureaucratic positions to be assigned relatively fairly and equally based on their competence and knowledge of Confucian thoughts and moralities.
And to some scholars, this has enabled a very early version of administrative democracy to take hold in um, governance. And many officials in the ranks as part of this administrative democracy would also work together to consult one another before decisions are made. But the issue is that Confucianism has neglected political authority. There are no developed ideas on how political power could be acquired and transferred. So for this, no distinction have been made by Confucius or subsequent scholars about what constitutes a legitimate power or what is the uh, differentiating factor between that and an illegitimate authority. So um, the only criteria which is it has and um, which could be retrospectively applied is to what extent does their rule conform with Confucian ideas of good governance, which is still strictly limited to the administrative realm. And to new Confucian scholars, it's because that Oh, it's because of the Confucian's focus strictly on administrative authority and the desire to produce quote-unquote sagely rulers and worthy ministers without the concept of political authority that has prevented democratization or even ideas of democracy to be proposed in Chinese history. Now, on to the second part and more important part of the argument. It's, it's that to new Confucian scholars, whilst China didn't develop democracy historically, that doesn't immediately mean that it, um, it shouldn't, or even that it can't. But rather, there are still many different areas of similarity between Confucianism and democracy. So this includes ideas such as the primacy of the people, which has been advocated by Mencius, which places the people as having the highest importance in society, whilst placing the ruler <laughs> and the king as the lowest. And this in Chinese is a uh, mingui junqing. And there's also this idea of equality in participation, that everyone is capable of becoming a person like the two legendary rulers in ancient China. In Chinese, 人皆可以为尧舜. And this highlights the possibility for democratization and democratic participation, as no individual is intrinsically limited by their class or by their background. And finally, whilst the ideas of freedoms and individual liberties Whilst this is not framed in terms of negative rights, in terms of rights that are like a priori in the, rest, in, in the West, that they are intrinsic to humans by virtue of their humanity, human rights can still exist in Confucian thought by virtue of their being positive obligations towards rulers and their people, to which um, rights like a um, righteous speech, well-being, and like a good life, this could be derived. <laughs> So, and this compatibility between Confucianism and democracy, or at least a lack of hostility presented here in a very, very simplistic form, could unlock vast potential for China's path to democratization. And at the very least, this can justify why there has not been significant resistance to democratization in Taiwan, which officially still calls themselves the Republic of China, despite the prominence of Confucian thinking in society. Thank you. Our next speaker, Emily Shelley, will take up the issue of the situation of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang in China. Emily will examine how China has used the international war on terror in an attempt to justify its abuses of the Uyghur peoples, taking account of the recent visit to the region of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Emily is a fourth year student at the University of New South Wales studying international studies and media. Over to you. Um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for your introduction, Ian. So in today's era of complex conflict, increasing insecurity and rising nationalism, governments are seemingly forced to confront the impossible trade-off between state security and the liberties of their citizens. But this inherently flawed debate, popularised in post 9-11 political discourse, rests on the assumption that the proposed trade-off is being made is regarding the security and liberty of the same group of individuals. However, in reality, this exchange is more often than not a trade-off of the rights of a minority group for the ultimate benefit of the ruling power. And this begs the question, what happens when a state exploits its power to reduce the liberties of its citizens, or when a reduction of freedoms turns into human rights abuse? Where do we draw the line? 
Tonight, I hope to critically evaluate Beijing's decision to wholly trade off the rights and freedoms of Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, supposedly in the interest of reducing the perceived threat of terrorism and advancing national security. I'll explore how Beijing has built upon rhetoric regarding the global war on terror in order to drastically limit the freedoms of Uyghur people and draw attention to some of the securitization measures that have been employed. And in doing so, I hope to make it evident that the reduction of civil liberties for perceived increases in security is never justifiable when a state exploits its power to do so and abuses human rights. So firstly, who are the Uyghur people? Well, looking into the history of the Xinjiang region, we can see that the repression of the Uyghurs has deep historical roots. What we see today is the latest move in an ethno-religious and political struggle that has been waged for decades and in different forms for centuries. So the Uyghur people are an ethnic minority in mainland China, a predominantly Muslim Turkic speaking population who live in the far northwestern province of Xinjiang. The region itself has a very long history of invasion and succession since it was first inhabited in 2000 BC, ruled at times by Mongolian nomads, the Han Empire and Turkic Khans. And following the establishment of the PRC in 1949, the region was peacefully liberated to become the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, sparking the formation of some Uyghur separatist groups who sought to establish their own independent state. And indeed, some of these separatist groups did incite violent insurgencies, whilst rising tensions between Han Chinese and Uyghurs in the region also led to sporadic hostilities. However, in the post-9-11 period, China was quick to quote, falsely reframe Uyghur separatism as an international terrorist emergency. For instance, they alleged that Uyghur separatist groups had received funds and training from terrorist organisations such as Al-Qaeda in neighbouring Afghanistan, and thus pose a seemingly insurmountable threat to the nation's security. This redefinition was also seemingly legitimised by the US, who formally classified an obscure armed separatist group, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, of which some members are of Uyghur origin, as a terrorist organisation, using this move as justification for the imprisonment of 22 Uyghurs in Guantanamo Bay, who were later cleared of any terrorism charges. Beijing's stance culminated in the launch of the Strike Hard campaign against violent terrorism in 2014, in which anyone suspected of sympathies, sympathies for separatism or involvement in illegal religious activities, i.e. the normal practice of Islam, could be detained without trial. And following the appointment of Chen Chuanggo as Xinjiang Communist Party Secretary in 2016, who previously ruled in Tibet, measures drastically intensified, including the introduction of the now notorious re-education camps, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So drawing attention to some of the lesser known securitization measures employed by Beijing, for example, the government has introduced what's called grid-style social management systems and mass civilian police recruitment, making Xinjiang one of the most heavily policed areas in the world. So grid-style social management is a system of 24-7, real-time mass surveillance, a mechanism through which the state can monitor and enforce restrictions that limit things like the practice of Islam and the use of social media, particularly to contact those in foreign countries, which has been outlawed. Additionally, the settler colonial practices of informal policing and civilian police recruitment are also rampant. Police recruitment in Xinjiang has increased exponentially since 2016, a 13-fold increase. And 86% of these hires were for assistant police positions at hundreds of so-called convenience police stations, found every 500 metres in Xinjiang's urban centres. Incentives such as rising wages and lower educational requirements mean that Uyghurs themselves are filling these police roles, thus effectively incorporating them into the security state. Of even more significant concern, these extreme security measures extend to the family homes of Uyghurs through a policy known as the Civil Servant Family Pair-Up, where Uyghur families are forcibly matched with civil servants or relatives and made to host them in their homes. These relatives covertly monitor the Uyghurs' behaviour and provide them with a model example of Chinese behaviour, in line with Beijing's policies. For example, well, relatives may bring gifts of language, may gifts, sorry, of alcohol prohibited in Islamic religion and expect that Uyghur family members will consume them. Those who don't risk being sent to re-education camps. As argued by Human Rights Watch, these restrictions on liberty and widespread unlawful detention constitute abuses to fundamental human rights and indeed constitute crimes against humanity. It is evident that under no circumstances could these reductions in freedoms of the Uyghur people ever be considered justifiable for incremental increases in security against a perceived, if not fabricated, war on terror. And as I've outlined, there is evidently some enormous abuses of international human rights standards occurring against the Uyghur people. So what does the UN Human Rights Office have to say? Well, High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet has just recently in May made a six-day visit to China, 
And as expected, the visit was highly restricted and the commissioner was unable to actually speak to any detained Uyghurs or their families. On the one hand, this UN, UN visit has seemingly fallen short of taking any tangible action to address human rights abuses in Xinjiang, and instead has played into Beijing's propaganda narrative, characterised by photo opportunities with government officials and the manipulation of her statements by Chinese media. On the other hand, the Commissioner has defended the trip by arguing that it was not an investigation, but rather an opportunity to engage with the government, stating that she had raised questions and concerns about the application of counter-terrorism and de-radicalisation measures, particularly regarding the impact on the rights of Uyghurs. This statement in itself is quite problematic. By framing the systemic cultural genocide of Uyghur people as a counter-terrorism issue, the High Commissioner arguably legitimises Beijing's anti-terrorism narrative that I've previously explored. The office still has not publicly released its long-awaited report into human rights violations in Xinjiang, despite requests from almost 200 NGOs. Meanwhile, human rights bodies like Amnesty International are urgently calling for the establishment of an independent international mechanism to investigate these violations. So to conclude, the situation in Xinjiang is undoubtedly an extremely complex and sensitive subject for governments to address, including Australia. Tonight I've attempted to explore how Beijing has built upon rhetoric regarding the global war on terror to fabricate a perpetual terror emergency in which the Uyghur people are culpable. In doing so, I've hoped to make it evident that the reduction of civil liberties is never justifiable when a state abuses human rights. As a nation and a people that unequivocally support the upholding of human rights and the rule of law, yet has vested economic interests in China, the situation in Xinjiang will certainly be an ongoing challenge for our new government to address. And ultimately, as our government seek to repair diplomatic relations with China, they will be wise not to forget that thawing diplomatic tensions does not mean we need to compromise on human rights. Thanks. Thank you very much, Emily. Our final speaker is going to talk about China's three warfare strategy. I'm not going to attempt to describe that because she's going to do it so much better. Our speaker is Rebecca Zhang, a fourth year student at the University of Sydney majoring in international relations and education, currently undertaking an honours year writing a thesis on potential cross-strait conflict. Over to you, Rebecca. Um, thanks, Ian, and thanks for my colleague's um, amazing talk. So tonight, um, I would like to talk about uh, People's Republic of China, PRC's three warfare strategy, and its application in Republic of China, ROC Taiwan. Briefly speaking, um, my presentation will regard the three warfare strategy as a new way of China's modern war fighting. And this talk, um, I will uh, revolve, revolve around three questions. How modern is modern warfare? And how, um, how China will fight these three uh, warfare? And how Taiwan has been subject to this strategy? Four months after the Ukraine crisis, and there's still a concern Taiwan will be the next. For me, this is unlikely, but it certainly raises important question, how China perceive this conflict and how it might fight a modern warfare. Before talking about modern warfare, I would like to use historian Margarita Macmillan's uh, definition of war, organized violence against another organized uh, group. Um, we, know, we all know war today is not like what it was. War has changed regarding its technology, techniques, context, and um, domains. In this address, what I want to emphasize, and perhaps the most salient for me, is the changing domain of modern warfare, that the battlefield has enhanced from kinetic to non-kinetic domain, such as media, cyberspace, and human mind. So second, how China may fight modern warfare? Here, I would like to introduce China's three warfare strategy as a miniature of its modern war fighting. The three warfares are public opinion, psychological, and legal warfare. Each has different targets and tasks, but all belong to information warfare that weaponize media and information to launch attacks. Simply put, 
public, public opinion warfare means using a variety of media um, to selectively publish messaging uh, with an intention to boost domestic morale and international support. Psychological warfare aims to manipulate media and information to attack the psychology and the behavior of the enemy. Legal warfare refers to strategic use of international law or domestic law to identify the opponent's violation behavior or legitimize on war conduct. This strategy was first developed um, in the People's Liberation Army's political war guideline in 2003. Since then, it has been institutionalized and implied, uh, employed in South China Sea conflict and Sino-India uh, dispute, and now in Taiwan. So how um, has Taiwan been subject to this strategy? On April 7, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen alerted that Taiwan has long been the front line of the cognitive warfare. She argued that in the future, this kind of attacks will only be stronger and more per pervasive. This April 2, um, the Double Think Lab published its first China Index report, which assessed the PRC's global uh, inferences, which could be divided into nine domains, media, foreign policy, academia, domestic politics, economy, technology, society, military, and law enforcement. Taiwan was overall ranked um, nine out of 36 countries that were surveyed. But notice, um, in the domain of society and the media, Taiwan ranked the first, which means these two areas are most influenced by the PRC according to its methodology. Back to the three warfare strategy, I will now um, demonstrate some examples. So regarding the public opinion of warfare, domestically, the PRC regarded Taiwan as an internal issue taking advantage of nationalist um, support and internationally. The notion of community of common destiny is a term coined by PRC to portray China um, as a peaceful racing power, as well as suggest a logic that one hurts or hurt. Hence, it increased the cost of overall uh, pro-Taiwan independence behavior. Regarding the psychological warfare, Last week, President Xi signed an order um, outlining China's military operation other than war. However, a um, specific article was not published and remains secret. In information warfare, we need to look at both what is said and what is not, because secrecy is a powerful weapon that constructs a sense of uncertainty and fear. <coughs> Regarding legal warfare, Usually the hottest dispute is around whether Taiwan is a de, de jure state. But there is a new tendency. Just last week, on 13 June, Foreign Minister, uh, for, foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin officially denied Taiwan as international waters. As he said, this is according to UN um, Convention OSC and the Chinese law. This is another sign of China's preemptive attempt to generate discourse to delegitimize its opponent's actions in the water. Because of the time limit, um, I can only show uh, a small part of the China's three warfare strategy in Taiwan. But at least we know um, this is not just an empty political slogan, but it's a planted implementation. Some may argue that state, some may argue other states also use this strategy. So why the three warfares are Chinese? I will answer because they embody a traditional military sword to win all without fighting from the art of war. Some can follow context that all countries will favor a military success that could be achieved with minimum cost. Fair enough. But what I want to suggest is the degree to which China can bear to use non-kinetic warfare to win and the specific consequences it can bring. Culture cannot and should not be a decisive factor uh, when it explains state's behavior, but we should recognize um, culture certainly has its ability to shape the way certain people think and how it may limit po um, potential possibilities when compared to other groups. I will wrap up uh, this talk by listing three Chinese characteristics of the three warfare design. First, continuing, they are deployed both in peacetime and wartime. Second, holistic. 
um, the three warfare serve an overarching strategy to use information as a modern capital uh, to counter the enemy's uh, cognition. Last is a new way of people's war because the line between military and a civilian, the state and the society are blurred. And it's always important to comprehend the different groups' way of thinking, as Albert Einstein once reminded us. Everything has changed, except the way we think. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. And thank you, Rebecca, and thank you all of our speakers. Full of stuff that I'd never heard. Very, very interesting material indeed. We now have what should have been 20 minutes, but is in fact 10 for questions, both from our online audience and from here in the room. Who'd like to start the ball rolling? Please. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, they were all very, very interesting talks. I have a question for the second speaker. Sorry, I've forgotten your name, but I'm just um, puzzled. You said that the Taliban disputed the Durant line, but if that line, which is essentially a century-old border, wasn't there, what do they prefer to have instead? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Oh, gee, you're much taller than I am. Uh, so uh, it's it's a tricky question because they have never really said what they want in terms of an actual border. But what they really want is to not have the Pashtun community separated on both sides of the country, which is fair for them. Uh, but my assumption would be that they want the border to be either below the North Vajiristan sort of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa region. I, 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 don't, I don't have a map, sorry. But <laughs> it would be either further to the south. Oh, it's a bit, yeah. uh, it would be either further to the south, where they can actually integrate the entire Pashtun community into Afghanistan, or that the border not be a hard border in the sense that people can freely move around. The problem with the current border is that Pakistan is actually building a fence on it, which is severely going to restrict Pashtuns to cross over. Um, and if memory serves me correctly, uh, I believe there was some attacks on census officers in Pakistan by the Taliban to prevent them from including Pashtuns in the area as part of the Pakistani population. So. I think either if either one is that they would like the border to be more south, or if there is a border, then it should be very lax in the sense that Pashtuns can actually walk through without being, uh, you know, under, uh, without giving any rigorous border checks or person uh, investigations and stuff. Is my assumption. I don't know if that answers the question properly, but it yeah. Sound very feasible, it? it doesn't, but unfortunately, it's 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 just the way that the the region in and of itself is, because Pashtuns are very tribal people, they are mountain people, they don't care so much about it. In fact, Fatah, which is a f uh, forest administered territory or something, they had their own autonomous region. They were autonomously, um, you know, ruled over by the Maliks and the, and the tribal leaders. Pakistan had nothing to do with that. So they are a very different people, they are governed differently, and that's why they want the law to be according to the way that they see law, essentially. Yeah. Does Pakistan still aspire to rule Afghanistan? No, no, I don't think they want that. They just want a friendly government in Afghanistan. But yeah, so far it's not really worked out. Um, the Ghani government was more friendly with India than it was with Pakistan. Because um, yeah, they, they've got a lot of issues, obviously, but Pashtuns and the area on North Pakistan is probably the biggest one of them. But, yeah. Thank you. John. Oh, um, yeah, my, my question's about um, Confucianism and democracy. Um, I, I have a, a superficial knowledge, um, I mean, based on reading Confucius, Confucius and um, Lao Tse and Penguin Classics um, of both. And it seems to me that Confucius, particularly where he talks about the mandate of heaven, um, could be interpreted um, as quite democracy friendly and perhaps Lao Tse even more so and indeed as positively anarchistic. Um, pray comment. Yeah, so um, in, in terms of political authority, there has been scholars that have said that um, the mandate of heaven can be related to 
democracy um, because the, how they assess the mandate of heaven is based on factors including popular sentiment. So in, in the sense that um, even Mencius have said that if the ruler has um, a ruled in a way that displeases the population, then they have effectively lost the mandate of heaven and can be killed. So that has been an argument and it is um, in some ways um, conducive to democracy or non conflict with power. However, the issue is that there has been no standard which has been established that has allowed this to be assessed. So essentially, um, the only issue of the mandate of heaven is that it's whatever the ruler wants to say. So to say, as long as they have the power, they can say that they have the mandate and no one can challenge them. Yep. Question from My understanding of Confucianism, as unsophisticated as it is, is that you need to bring no shame on the family. And by bringing no shame on the family, which is a very uh, conformist position, and then if you don't bring shame on the family, you don't bring shame on the regional government. And then you don't bring shame on the nation. So that the ideological position is first the family, then the local government, and then the nation, which I think is a great way of ensuring conformity throughout society. What is your position on that? So with New Confucianism, um, well, the reason why I've emphasised Hong Kong and Taiwanese scholars is that there's actually two schools of New Confucianism. One in Hong Kong and Taiwan saying that it is conducive to democracy, and, but there has been a new school of New Confucianism in mainland China that have argued since the 2010s that Confucianism is actually not conducive to democracy, and it's done via two different readings of Confucius. So. Um, your, your opinion on that and your views on that is perfectly valid. It's just a different interpretation, um, and it, they're like two competing discourses. We have time for at least a couple more questions. Do we have one online? We do. Fantastic. Uh, we have a question online for Rebecca uh, about the uh, Three Wars strategy. Um, so historically, Taiwan has been fairly reticent to use some of the tools of international law at its disposal, for example, uh, seeking full statehood. If Taiwan was to want to counter the strategy, uh, is that something that they should be looking to do more, trying to enshrine themselves more in the international system? Um, thanks for the question, and it's a great question. Um, I would say, firstly, we need to clarify the purpose of international law. So um, there has been a discussion, I think, last year about uh, whether Taiwan is a de facto de jure state and what kind of international law should be applied. It. And I think uh, one professor, uh, Chris Hughes from LSE, he said um, the best way to uphold the rule-based international order is to use the international law to deter um, aggression and to create the uh, conditions for for regional conflicts. So I think it's really important, like how do you uh, suit at international law? And if you say uh, using ta uh, Taiwan use uh, international current international law to counter three, uh, China's three warfare strategy, I don't think um, Taiwan could be. Uh, uh, enough to counter back because international law and the China's position in the United States certainly put Taiwan in a less um, advantageous position. But um, within some green zone, like um, outside international statehood, Taiwan can certainly um, expand its other relation rather than political relation with other states, which will certainly win some international support. and. Uh, um, international law is not permanent, for my opinion. So I think there is uh, uh, there will be still other um, opportunity for Taiwan to counter back um, the aggression from the mainland China. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Pro Professor Jocelyn Che. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I actually have got 
I thought we should even out the questions. Um, and so I've got a question for Drew and I've got a question for Emily, but as I'm restricted to one, so I think I'll ask Drew because we've had several speakers about China. And while Drew has been talking about the Pacific with relation to China, but my question is more about, you know, our uh, new government's policy, Pacific policy. And it seems to me that um, the main problem we've had in the past has been a, like a colonialist um, attitude that we know what is best for you. Um, there are, if we look at it from the point of view of Fiji or the Solomons or any other Pacific island, uh, there are those international studies scholars who say that a small nation actually has more power than its size would indicate in that you know they're all equal for instance in the united nations and each of them has the the power to act on its on its own so what exactly do you think should be the mentality of our, our incoming government towards uh, developing a Pacific policy? To what extent should we be listening to them and responding to their views? And to what extent should we be talking to regional organizations such as the Pacific Island Forum? Or should we be coordinating with New Zealand who have a major interest there? or? Um, just how should we go about it? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's, you know, it depends on what the interests are of the government at the end of the day. We've seen in the past decade or so that um, the pursuit of policy in the region has been very much strategic interest based on the side of Australia. And as a result, we now have this relationship with the Pacific that is almost non-existent. And we've gained somewhat economically out of that, but now we're in this position where we now have to rebuild and start again. And so in order, in my personal opinion, to avoid that situation from becoming prevalent again is to openly engage in good faith uh, with Pacific Island nations. And so they have shown preference in the past for the Pacific Island Forum and have been somewhat frustrated by the lack of respect shown um, in those fora by both Australia and New Zealand. It was only in 2019 that we saw um, uh, leaders walk out in disgust as both Australia and New Zealand uh, blocked substantial action on climate change and a commitment to action on climate change in the region. They've also shown uh, similar emotions in response to both Australia and New Zealand refusing to recognise uh, West Papua as a sovereign um, autonomous region as well. So in order to strengthen the relationships that we have there, we do have to engage open heartedly because they, they recognise Australia's behaviour as um, colonial. And what we sometimes forget is that Australia was a colonial power for a brief period of about 50 years or so, where we held Papua New Guinea and we held Nauru, and we exploited both those countries for their resources and left them quite unstable afterwards. The Pacific Islands haven't forgotten that. And they recognise the behaviour that we show towards them in trying to bolster relations and um, ensuring that <coughs> influence from China um, only reaches a certain capacity. They recognise that that behaviour isn't in their interest. It's in the interest of the United States. It's in the interest of Australia. So we have to come to them with solutions to problems that they face, whether it be climate change, whether it be um, access to the internet but come at them willing to negotiate and willing to hear their perspectives on the issues, not coming to them with a pre-prepared policy that we want them to implement. Thank you. We have time for one last question online. Yep. Uh, our final question online uh, is for Emily. Um, and it asks, uh, traditionally Xinjiang has been a difficult problem for international actors to solve. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel in this regard? Is there any methods that have been more effective than others in trying to shed light on the issue, uh, given the recent problems that we've seen with the UN process? Hello, um, thanks for your question. Um, 
It's obviously a very complex situation, but I think the answer is yes. There's certainly things that the international community and Australia can be doing um, to address this situation. Um, I think firstly, um, any action that's taken needs to be communicated really consistently and not used as a stick to bash China at a politically opportune moment. Um, I think a good way to um, give some response to the situation is to pick a specific um, issue like forced labour, where um, governments um, can have some jurisdiction over introducing um, laws um, in their own countries um, about forced labour. So, for example, um, Australia could ratify the International Labour Organization's um, forced labour protocol, which we currently haven't done. Um, we also have a Modern Slavery Act in 2018, which we could significantly amend um, yeah, to advocate to make a mandatory for businesses um, operating in um, our country to undertake human rights processes um, to ensure that they're, they're not supporting forced labour that comes from Xinjiang. Um, also another thing that could be taken would be banning imports of specific goods produced in Xinjiang where evidence of forced labour links is really strong, um, for example cotton. Um, yeah, so I think in order to be effective, targeted um, measures are probably the most effective rather than blanket um, statements or actions um, condemning the situation. Thanks. Thank you. Alas, we've run out of time for questions. Warmest thanks to all of you who've come along here to Glover Cottages this evening and all those who've joined us online for this event. For those who are feeling the cold, it may be encouraging to know that just over 10 minutes ago, we passed through the winter equinox. <laughs> so summer's just around the corner. <laughs> Our event next week will be, uh, Tuesday the 28th of, of June, will be a launch here of Richard Bronowski's update of his 2003 book, Fact or Fission. Richard addresses the debates about the application of nuclear technology in Australia, whether to peaceful uses, generation of power, or for discussion of nuclear arms, and takes account of the uh, role of the AUKUS grouping that we've joined in making some prospect of there being nuclear-powered submarines in Australia. So do come along and join us for that launch next week. But to round off this evening, I'd like to express very warm thanks to our five interns, not only for such interesting material this evening and for some pretty good answers to difficult questions, but also for the very real contribution you've made to the success of the Institute over these six months, during circumstances which at times have been difficult due to the COVID e e epidemic. It's been a very great pleasure to know you all and I hope you'll stick around.